Thank you. I will now recognize Mr. Bretchett for five minutes. I'm looking forward to your questions on AI, sir. Thank you, Chair Lady. Mr. Thayer and Mr. Chilson, what's the historical background of the Defense Production Act? Well, it was put in place, sir, to make sure that America had the proper productive capacity of, the, uh, of I mean, our... I realize that, but I mean, what is... I, I want to know the, the background. What, what caused it to be in place? A concern about the lack of a productive capacity in certain sectors that the federal government felt were necessary to achieve various national security purposes. This was, of course, in the 1950s, different, right. different time. That's what I was getting at, yeah, the Korean right, War. a long time ago. Yes, sir. And the primary purpose of the Defense Production Act is to allow the president to direct the production of materials and goods. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. What materials or goods does Executive Order 14110 direct companies to produce? <laughs> Documents containing highly sensitive uh, commercial and uh, cybersecurity information. Okay. And what national security concerns exist regarding AI that justifies using the Defense Production Act? Well, I think there are national security concerns around AI. We've heard a lot of talk about, uh, you know, the rivalry uh, with China and the, the importance of staying ahead. So there are concerns there. But as for ones that um, directly address uh, threats, uh, the kinds of threats to interrupted production that the Defense Production Act is, is looking for, again, um, as Adam said, it, it turned the DPA on its head, which the DPA is, is to allow the government to spur production and the executive order uses the DPA in order to discourage production on some levels, in part by uh, imposing additional regulatory burdens on, uh, on people who are producing at the highest level. Has the Defense Production Act been used to extract information from companies rather uh, than to encourage production? Either one of y'all? Not that I'm aware of. I've heard that there has been already an immediate request uh, uh, for based on this use of the Defense Production Act, but I think in the past I, I'm not aware of another one. Do you think using the Defense Production Act to regulate artificial intelligence is a bit of an overreach, and would Congress be better suited to regulate um, artificial intelligence? Yes, Congressman, I think that's right. Uh, the, the authority begins here to decide what the Defense Production Act should do, and I think now we're witnessing pretty excessive overreach uh, uh, of the statute. Do you all think that this executive order could stifle artificial intelligence innovation? I do, and I think the use of the DPA uh, here um, undermines some of the other important goals that uh, Congresswoman Presley was, was pointing out about government uses and the risks of government use uh, in of AI. Ma'am, you were shaking yeah. your head. May I respond? Yes. I, I actually disagree with that. I think, um, and, and going to my colleague here who I've known for many years, um, I think what the congressman was talking about does not require the use of the DPA. In all honesty, it actually just requires transparency, disclosure, that kind of stuff. I think the DPA was actually exercised based on just giving some uh, push to us to do something as a national economy so that we make sure we're not behind others, particularly China, when it comes to AI. Ms. Huddleston, you haven't responded. Would you like to? I, I would agree with Mr. Tilson that I do think there are significant concerns about how the executive order could stifle innovation at a time when AI is still just emerging and we're just starting to understand the potential beneficial applications of it as well as the potential risk. Do you all think that the executive order strengthens the U.S.'s ability to maintain its lead over China? Ma'am. I do. And um, again, responding to my colleagues, when we talk about stifling innovation um, and invention in this country when it comes to AI, I think we have two different conversations going on. One is a conversation around the efficiency and use of AI in areas like, you know, occupational careers, different sub-stacks, technological applications. The other was around the socio-technical application. How, do the pub how does the public interest benefit from the use of AI? And I would just urge us to sort of not conflate those two well, areas. How does it do that? Um, when we have an informed populace that understands that technology is embedded in basically everything that we're doing today, our informed populace can make decisions that actually benefit their quality of life. When they don't know that these technologies or AI-generated content is happening, we are actually stifling our ability to move this nation into a space where, to your point, we can stay competitive with our rivals. Yeah, my biggest fear with this, again, is we don't understand it. Heck, I don't understand it. And um, Mace, Chair Lady Mace probably understands it, and my colleague 
across the aisle probably understands it, but here again, we're going to start regulating something we don't understand because we're government and we're supposed to. And then again, it's just like cryptocurrency and everything else, that gummit will end up hurting it. And I, you know, so that's my concern. Um, Chair Lady, I yield back none of my time. Matter of fact, it's a negative amount of time. So I don't know if that penalizes you did good, me Mr. in the Burchett. next one or I, not. I will now yield to Mr. Burleson for 